Getting into chiropractic school is not easy, but for the 30% who got accepted into chiropractic school, we are in a very challenging four year. Hi friends, my name is Calvin. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. I'm a first year chiropractic student in Toronto, Canada. So I go to chiropractic school having already completed my master's in science, so I thought I had a pretty good handle on this grad school thing. But I quickly learned that chiropractic school would be the most challenging four years in academics that I have ever had. So if you're thinking about chiropractic school or just getting started in a new chiropractic school this year, here are three things I wish I knew before going into chiropractic school. And especially number three, I will talk dollars and cents and how much it is going to cost me to become a chiropractor in Canada. Number one, you have to know that all chiropractic service is provided in the form of private healthcare. In simple terms, in countries with a publicly funded healthcare system such as Canada and UK, chiropractic services is not covered by the government. So if you need chiropractic care, you are essentially required to pay out of your own pocket. This could be a problem for people who rely on universal healthcare coverage for chiropractic services, and I genuinely think that people should have access to the healthcare services they need without any financial hardship. So in Ontario, Canada, OHIP is the healthcare insurance plan provided for the citizen, and currently OHIP does not cover for chiropractic care. It is interesting to see though, when I dig into the record, it actually says that OHIP did cover for chiropractic care before December 1st in 2004. However, after this date, it was later withdrawn from the OHIP coverage due to a cut in funding. This is interesting because an independent study demonstrated, and I quote, chiropractic management of low back pain is more cost effective than medical management, and that there would be high significant cost savings if more management of low back pain was transferred from medical physicians to chiropractors. With the lifetime prevalence of low back pain to be around 80%, delisting chiropractic from the OHIP coverage in some way would be counterintuitive to the decisions in fund saving in the long term. Of course, these healthcare plans do vary from province to province, and I know that in British Columbia, the medical service plan actually covered for chiropractic services with supplementary benefits. That extends to private healthcare insurance plan and most people do actually have these insurance plan from their work. And in most cases, they cover partial or full fee depending on the policy. If you're interested in this topic, I would like to extend on a few thoughts. If chiropractic, on the other hand, were in the public healthcare services, do you think it is a good thing? To answer this question, I think it will be best to think from the patient's point of view. Firstly, yes, of course, you do not have to pay for the services. But if you think about the process to get to a musculoskeletal specialist nowadays, you typically have to go through different stages. And firstly, a GP initial consultation, which then an orthopedic referral. And there you realize surgical options look too scary for the patient. And therefore, patient opt for a more conservative approach which then another referral and finally reaching to a chiropractor. This whole process takes a considerable amount of time in terms of traveling and waiting for the patient. And in cases where musculoskeletal patient is already not very mobile, a referral back and forth may potentially delay treatment and affect recovery. In the world of ever growing patient population and the only longer waiting times, does that mean that it is better off for chiropractic to be in the private healthcare sector? Hmm, I think that is very hard to say, but I definitely think it is worth the time to consider both sides of the picture. Because there can be some merits to being within the private healthcare sector, and one thing is that you get to control your own practice styles. Because in the public healthcare system, the practice landscape is often quite standardized. One example is that if you're interested in sports injury, you can have the freedom to specialize in treating the athletic population, whereas in the public healthcare sector, this freedom is often much more restricted. Another benefit, and that's from a patient's point of view, is that private healthcare can minimize time required for referral and waiting. And for the patients, 
that would mean that they have a greater chance for a timely treatment and therefore a better prognosis. So there are really pros and cons and it is very hard to say which sector is better than the other. But I'd like to know what you guys think about this. Leave a comment down below and tell me which healthcare sector would suit the chiropractic profession better. Secondly, the history of the chiropractic profession is complicated and it may confuse you in finding your chiropractic identity. When you first think of applying to chiropractic school, it may be harder for you to come across because you really have to dig deep into the history to understand that. In a nutshell, as the profession developed centuries ago, the fundamental values of the profession kind of broke into two schools of thought. On one side are chiropractors who seek for an evidence-based approach, on the other side, some chiropractors strive to remain vitalistic ideas in their practice. The former utilizes robust scientific evidence to inform their practice, while the latter uses philosophy and historical dogma as their clinical rationale. So why is this a problem? This is a problem especially for me as a first year student, as internally this divergence have manifested themselves to me as an identity struggle for how chiropractors should practice. And externally, this disparity between these groups has divided the profession and invited ridicule from both the scientific community and the public at large. As a healthcare profession, public trust is something we uphold and these disagreements around the scope of practice, vocabularies and ethics have really negatively affected the public opinion cultural authority and interprofession relationships. I want to credit this paper here who was written by a first year chiropractic student in Australia who included his opinions on this issue and it was an insightful read. With countless debates on this issue and that two parties remain a strong stance, the author suggested the way forward in the profession is not to further discredit one ideological line over another but instead spending more time and focusing on improving patient care. And in front of us is the low hanging fruit being the proven need for conservative musculoskeletal care. For instances, the data emerging from Alberta province in Canada demonstrate that by promoting a position that chiropractic is the management of musculoskeletal disorders by conservative care, Alberta's chiropractors enjoy a 20% utilization rate province wide. And adding to these figures, we see a 90% patient satisfaction rating, and we might easily conclude that Albertan chiropractors, despite the potential differences in their chiropractic identity, are on the right track for the betterment of the profession. So I think the main takeaway from this point is that to think rather if the chiropractic profession could or should find a unified way forward, what we really should be focusing is to address the need for conservative spinal care which was shown to reflect both patient wants and needs. And of course what we should also be thinking about is to smash the like button down below to adjust the algorithm so that more people are aware of this. <laughs> the third thing I want to talk about is that graduating with a $152,000 student loan debt is not ideal. In Canada, the average annual tuition for chiropractic school is around 26,000 Canadian dollars. Adding at least a thousand spending on food, rent and commuting costs and you will come close to $152,000 in total student loan debt over the four years. And that does not even include your student loan in your undergraduate because chiropractic education is done in graduate school. So I want to be totally honest with you guys and to just say that I am in a very privileged position that my parents is supporting me and lending me this money. But I also think it is very important to bring this up in this video because for almost all my friends out there, this is a serious financial challenge. So upon some research, I actually find this one student finance channel speaking around this issue specifically for chiropractic students. And what they found was that among all the healthcare profession, chiropractic students actually have the worst back to income ratio. And especially in the United States, this number comes to about 4.9 debt to income ratio. In simple terms, that essentially means that 
if you earn $100,000 in the future, you will incur $490,000 in return for student loan debt. Now, of course, this is probably an overestimate because people who are reaching out to these finance agencies are probably at greater step. So please be cognizant of that. Now, it's not that I think you should pick a career based on the money you earn, but I think it's also very important to think about what these loads of student debt will mean for you in the long run. So looking at the numbers from OSAP, which is a student financial aid agency in Ontario, the minimum payment in a standard nine and a half year repayment plan with an interest average on 2.75% for a student loan total at $152,000 is calculated to be just over $1,500 per month. That's an $18,000 pay cut every year in your next 10 years. In other words, you would turn your chiropractic job with a median salary of $51,000 into a $33,000 job very quickly. The best advice I could give for a future student is to strongly consider the cheapest school when you apply for a chiropractic program. Because after graduation, if you pass the board's exam, you will eventually end up with the same license for practice. Another thing is to explore different side hustles along the way that could ease your financial stress. So just pick anything really that doesn't affect your revision schedule. Whether being a student tutor or doing a part-time job at your local coffee shop. This year, personally, I've applied for a note-taker position at my school and they essentially pay you to take notes for the class in every lectures. And while the pay isn't really that much, as a responsible and participating student, I'm already taking notes for myself, so I'm as well getting paid. So look for opportunities like this because every penny counts. Of course, whether you want to choose a part-time job or not, the money that you spend outside of tuition will matter as well. So being wise on spending the money outside of tuition over those four years of school is also very important. You really don't want any unnecessary spending on top of your back-breaking amount of student debt you already have. So there we have it. These are the three things I wish I knew before going to chiropractic school. If you find this helpful, please give a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. If you're applying to chiropractic school, you really want to watch through my chiropractic student life series and I will see you in the next video.